Hey everybody, I am here with Flip. He is a professor at UC Riverside, right in our backyard, almost. And we are really excited to talk to him because he specializes in dark matter um, and some really great science. So, Flip, thank you so much for talking to Thanks us today. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited because I sat in on one of your panels that you did. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. And you are a science communicator. That's right. That's one of the hats that I put on. Wonderful. Can you talk to us a little bit about what science communication is and how you are taking this really big academic topic and making it accessible sure. for people like our students? <laughs> so, science communication is just this idea that the science that we do, especially the science that's publicly funded, uh, the moment that you find the groundbreaking discovery, the eureka moment, then you write it up and you submit it to a journal where other people judge and say, oh yeah, this person really made this huge discovery. And then they publish it. And then the rest of the world can read about that fantastic research. You're not done yet. So science communication is about the idea that part of your job, part of your duty to the people who funded you, to, to your culture, to your society, is to share that research and share the context in which that research is important. Awesome. And one thing you touched on in the panel was how when you submit to these journals and when these journals are published, these are really journals that are being read by other scientists. And That's so they right. tend to be filled with jargon and That's really right. undigestible information. That's how right. are you working to make that more accessible to everybody, um, even in high school and middle school? That's right. So often when scientists talk to each other, which is when we write for each other, it's, it's that type of speaking, uh, it sounds like... CSI or, or, or some kind of medical drama, it's just a bunch of jargon. Um, but when we talk to others, when we talk to, to people in the general public, when we talk to students, uh, we need to figure out how to change the way that we communicate to better convey the important ideas. And that's not a natural thing when you spend 90% of your time inside of a lab. That's awesome. Now, during the panel, you also gave a really great example of how to relate what you're working on to everyday life right. by talking about a radioactive banana. That's right. So here, here is a fun fact. The bananas that you eat, maybe put on your cereal or you have after a run, they're actually radioactive. So I don't know if you knew this, but they are actually a source of antimatter. That is crazy cool. So should we not be eating bananas? Bananas are perfectly safe. They're okay. actually very healthy. Good. I had one this morning. So how is it that bananas are radioactive? So bananas are really funny. So one thing that uh, the, the food label will tell you is that bananas are high in potassium. And it turns out a small fraction of potassium on Earth is actually this unstable uh, isotope. That means that over a long period of time, it'll decay. And what's really funny about this particular type of isotope is it under, undergoes a particular type of decay called inverse beta decay, where you produce positrons. Now, positrons are just a fancy name for an electron, but backwards. These are antimatter versions of electrons. That's incredible. So what advice would you give to students who are currently in middle school and high school and trying to figure out what they want to do? Oh, dive in. The, the most important thing is to dive in. And I, I remember when I was a student in middle school and high school, I knew that I loved physics. I, I fell in love with physics reading the physics of Star Trek, so I became a Trekkie and a young physicist at the same time. We have that book in our library. Go look it's it up. It's fantastic. Um, but then I got really frustrated because I thought, I can't discover warp drive. I need to go through and do all this math, all this science, go to college. How do I, how do I figure out what my life is going to be like? And it was actually through books like The Physics of Star Trek that I figured out, oh, this is exactly what's going on in this field. You know, maybe I don't know the detailed mathematics. You, you still have to go through the training, but at least you figure out what is exciting about the field. That's awesome. Wonderful. And what is the next thing that you're working on or hoping to be working on? Oh, so right now I'm trying to figure out what dark matter is, and in particular, how can we hope to discover it? Right? Nice. Dark matter is the stuff that is invisible, so you can't see it. It's not touchable, you pass right through it, so you can't touch it. So the big question in my field is, how do you do science on it? That's awesome, very cool. And do you have any inklings of that yet, of how do we do science on it? We're not quite sure, but one, one direction that I'm really excited about is maybe we are looking for dark matter the wrong way because we're looking today, in the present. Oh, 
true. Maybe what we really need is a time machine okay. to look at dark matter in the early universe. Nice. And it turns out, well, that sounds like sci-fi. It turns out our telescopes are actually time machines. Yeah. Because you look far away into the sky. Yeah. It takes light time to get here. Right. You're actually looking at the universe at an early stage. That's fantastic. Wonderful. Flip, thank you so much for talking with thank us. Thank you we for really having me. We really appreciate taking the time. Right. Cheers. Awesome.